Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IEIC Distinguished Lecturers webinar. I'm Yoichi Sato from the University of Tokyo, and I'll be a moderator of the seminar today. First, let me introduce today's speaker, Professor Koichi Kise of Osaka Metropolitan University. Professor Kise received his PhD degree in communication engineering from Osaka University in 1991. He was a visiting professor at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, known as DKFI, from 2000 to 2001. He is now a first professor of the Department of Core Informatics and the director of the Institute of Document Analysis and Knowledge Science at Osaka Metropolitan University. He has also been the director of the Japan Laboratory of DKFI since 2022. His major research activities are in analysis, recognition, and retrieval of documents, images, and human activities. He worked as the chair of the IAPR Technical Committee 11 on reading systems and a member of the IAPR conferences and meeting committee. He's currently uh, the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Document Analysis and Recognition. After Professor Kise's talk, we will have time for Q&A. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box of this Zoom. They will be answered later. OK, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Coach Kise. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? And uh, thank you very much for uh, Professor Sato. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So let me share my slide to start. So can you see my screen? Yes. OK, thank you very much uh, again for the kind introduction. And my name is Coach Kise. Today's uh, my title of my talk is Reading of Reading for Actuating, Augmenting uh, Human Reading and uh, learning by sensing and actuating technologies. So let's move on. Uh, today, my talk consists of the following six parts. And the first, let me do the self-introduction. After that, as a part of the self-introduction, I would like to introduce the DFKI, German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And then, uh, after that, I would like to, to talk uh, three to six as the main part of my talk. First of all, uh, again, my name is Koichi Kise, and uh, uh, this is, okay. Yep. This is my Chinese character. If you uh, can read the Japanese character or Chinese character, this is my, my uh, original representation of my name. And I'm a, a professor of the Graduate School of Informatics, Osaka Metropolitan University. You may not know uh, uh, about the Osaka Metropolitan University because it's new. Uh, it's founded in 2022 as a merger of two publicly funded university, Osaka, Osaka Prefecture University and Osaka City University. And now becoming the 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 third largest uh, university, in, uh, publicly funded founded university in Japan uh, in terms of the, the number of undergrad students. And also the, I'm a director of uh, Laboratory Japan, German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence or DFKI. And uh, after this uh, self-introduction, I'm going to, to show you a little bit about uh, this organization. And my research field is human activity sensing and actuation, augmented learning and education, and document analysis and image understanding. So, uh, uh, Osaka Metropolitan University, as I told you, uh, started uh, from April 2022 as a of two, two uh, publicly funded university, both of which were uh, had the um, uh, almost equal size of the, the number of students, so that this makes it uh, 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 quite the large uh, university, the, as I told you, the third largest publicly founded university in Japan. 
I believe that the, the largest is Osaka University, national funded Osaka University, and the sec second one is Tokyo, and then third is ours. Okay, so the, let me go into the details of uh, introduction to the FBI. So, and uh, maybe some of you have already known that uh, this is the old DFK logo, and this is new one. Recently, changed they changed the logo, but in my slide, the most of them are with this old logo. Sorry for this one. Yeah, and uh, this is the map of Germany, and uh, as you can see here, the DFK is started in year two thousand. Uh, sorry, nineteen eighty eight. Uh, with two sites, Zarbrücken and the Kaiserslautern. And at the time of start, Zarbrücken is a, was a headquarter, but now the Kaiserslautern is a headquarter. And they started uh, in 1988 at the time of the second boom of AI. So and then they opened uh, several branches in Bremen, Berlin, and Oldenburg, Osnabrück, and recently they uh, launched the, the, the latest one down, uh, at the Darmstadt. As you can see here, uh, the DFKI is uh, the, the distributed all over Germany. So uh, from the name of the, the organization, DFKI or German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence sounds like a public uh, research center, but it's not true. This is the company, but the nonprofit. And this company is uh, with the 32 share shareholders shown here. So most of them are quite big uh, um, company like SAP, NVIDIA, Daimler, Airbus, and also the some local uh, universities like this one, the public universities are also the shareholder. And from Japan, only the company Rico is uh, joining uh, to this uh, uh, company. And uh, the DFK now uh, recognized uh, by uh, important uh, politicians like them. So they started the 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 their research center uh, in 1988, and this is the the vertical axis represent the 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 size of the budget, and it was a very very small start, but uh, as you can see here, it grows uh, constantly uh, without you know decreasing. And it's amazing, at least for me, that it's amazing that at the time of the winter of the AI, uh, which uh, start, started from around here, uh, it didn't affect to the size of the budget of the FKI. And, uh, uh, and the economical crisis happened here also didn't affect uh, to the to the, their activity. So... And nowadays, the size of the, the employee, the number of employees in DFKI is about 1,500. And uh, the budget currently, uh, uh, as of uh, 2022, uh, more than 80 million yen. And uh, they're, they're having uh, the more than 500 ongoing projects. And the employees are from more than uh, 80 countries, including Japan. And one of the, the uh, important uh, factor of the FKI is that most of the, the researchers or workers or employees are quite young, just before or after uh, getting a PhD. After getting a PhD based on the, their work at the FKI, some of them graduated graduates uh, to start their own company or joining the existing company or being a professor. And after that, they they uh, do their job. And while they're doing their job, 
they're, they're coming back to DFPI as a kind of collaborators. And this is really a good uh, uh, ecosystem of DFKI. And they have already produced more than uh, 4,500 alumni. And this is really uh, supporting the DFKI activity and makes it possible to continuously grow. And, and this is the list of uh, the, uh, the customers who ask the DFKI to produce the solutions by using the modern AI technologies, and uh, including the some major Japanese company like uh, Hitachi, NEC, or Omron, or Wacom, or Sony. And the mission of the AI is uh, is uh, to enable industry to successfully use a state of the art AI technology. And they have also also produced some startups like this one. And uh, more than 3,000 jobs, high-tech jobs, have already been produced by the FKI. And one of them is uh, uh, started by my previous student, Alpha Ben. And he did his PhD in the FKI and then started his company. Now he's coming back to Japan, but uh, his, his company is still running in, in Germany. And uh, the FK has its own competence centers, including the deep learning center, like this one. And uh, the, the DFK is also known as a launch customer of a new GPU from NVIDIA. And uh, they're, they're, uh, they have been uh, the first user of a new uh, GPU when it released by um, uh, NVIDIA. And these are the competence center members of uh, the usage of the competence center. And they also have living labs like uh, this one, smart office or a smart city. And they have many more. And some of them, let me introduce uh, some of them, uh, uh, which is related to the headquarter, Kaiserslautern. And one is a smart factory. Uh, this is about the representation of the industry, German industry 4.0 here. And also the another one is Immersive Quantified Learning Lab, IQL. And uh, this is uh, uh, mostly related to the today's, my, uh, today's talk. Okay. And uh, this is last but not least, but the... Uh, another unique idea of, of the FKI is that, uh, coming from the transfer labs. And industry partners are always uh, asking the FKI uh, to, to help them to, do, to, to, to uh, build the solution by giving the research money. And, uh, but the, in the transfer lab, they have also agreed to use the part of their, their uh, research money as a scholarship of the basic research. For example, machine learning graduate school. And this is uh, for PhD students who are uh, interested in the basic research like uh, deep learning. And as a result, if something new uh, is found, uh, this is fed back to the project and then uh, project uses it uh, to find out the solution. And for the industry partner, it's quite uh, nice because by using not so much amount of money, they're able to, to get the up-to-date or state-of-the-art AI technology and without having their own basic research center. And this is really successful uh, cases. And uh, they're extending the, the participant of the this transfer labs. Okay, and we are currently working in DFKI Lab Japan and DFKI uh, currently working uh, together uh, with uh, three or four different projects. One of them is uh, also quite uh, relevant to today's talk, Learning Science for Toronto. This is the JST DFG and ANR funded trilateral AI project. And the, go the goal of this project is uh, to uh, realize the AI empowered human knowledge ecosystem. 
And in addition to the, the DFKI and the French researcher from the LIMSI CNRS, Professor Laurence Deviers, uh, is uh, joining us to do uh, the, this joint research. And uh, the today's my talk is mostly related to these two steps. Uh, and this pro uh, re project is to implement the uh, learning cycle, Torum, we call it the learning cycle ecosystem by using these three steps, per perceiving, mastering, and transferring. But today's my talk is uh, mostly related to these two, two, two steps. Uh, uh, perceiving is to, to help learners to recognize new knowledge, to learn. And uh, mastering is a process to make the perceived knowledge usable by the, the learner. Okay, in addition, uh, uh, we are also working on the, the collaboration of uh, Graduate School of Medicine uh, for the successful application of uh, AI to medicine. And one uh, important feature, unique feature of this project is that the main actor is not the professor, but the students. Students are working together and then uh, to, to find that solution by using the, oh, in the field of uh, medicine, by using the modern AI technologies. Now, uh, they're visiting DFKI. So currently the, the four members from DFKI, uh, sorry, four members from the Graduate School of Informatics and the four from the uh, Graduate School of Medicine or uh, School of Medicine are joining uh, to go to DFKI. And they, uh, since yesterday, they started their visit for one month there. And we also uh, have been working on the uh, Smart City Osaka and the Smart uh, University uh, to implement uh, uh, this framework, as well as the Industry 4.0 and Smart Agriculture. And that's all for the, the little bit long introduction of uh, the DFKI. If you are interested in, please let me uh, know through the chat and uh, I can, I can uh, answer to your questions. Uh, uh, okay, so now let's move on to the uh, next topic and the main topic, reading of reading for actuating. And uh, first, uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about the importance of reading activities. So I'm always uh, starting from this slide, what are you? And in the physical sense, you are what you, you ate. Your body is made from what you ate, right? And uh, this lady is eating the yogurt, <laughs> and this is part of, uh, will be part of her body. But from the, the inside of her brain, uh, I can say that uh, she is what she, she has read. And uh, the, this is the, the, because the main source of the, your knowledge is from the reading. So reading is a really an important uh, modality uh, for acquiring knowledge by human. So reading activity is, uh, uh, so we, we need to know what to read or how much you, you read or how well you understand. And the uh, Irish writer, Richard Steele uh, said that reading to the mind is what the exercise is to the body. So as an animal, uh, we, we need to do the exercise, otherwise uh, your health is going to be spoiled. But the reading is also the kind of sports to your mind. And you, you need to, to continuously doing this to, to make, it, uh, make you uh, active enough. So uh, because of this uh, importance of the reading activities, we launched uh, the, the project called the Reading Life Blog. And this is more than 10 years ago. And, uh, but uh, it's, it's quite the uh, important origin of our research. So that let me introduce, briefly introduce what we have done. So this is the, the about the 15 years ago. 
the running on the laptop and on the left side you're seeing the the uh, captured uh, movie by using the web web camera as soon as the the each frame is uh, obtained by a laptop it is a uh, corresponding part of uh, of the page is uh instantly um, searched within the database of uh, at this time 5000 or 10000 pages and it is instantly done by using our uh, our technology and this is based on the point-to-point -point matching of the pitch point, like this one. So, so we use the 2D distribution of those points. Those points are coming from the center of the wide regions. And uh, by using the unique indexing scheme, we are able to, to do this matching instantly by using a matching technology. And this is query, and this is retrieve our result. And at that time, we scaled up to the uh, to this technology up to, to 100 million pages. And the, the time uh, required to search uh, within the database of 100 million pages is less than 30 milliseconds per page. And also the, the accuracy was quite high, uh, around 99%. So if you're uh, thinking that the normal book consists of 250 pages, 100 million pages means that 400,000 books. This is a side of the middle class uh, rivalry. And uh, rivalry, any pages of in the rivalry can be instantly searched. And by using this technology, we started building the reading lifelog method. And this method re uh, uses this uh, document image retrieval technology uh, to find out the corresponding part, but uh, by using this eye tracker, uh, which locate your eye gaze here, and by uh, uh, calculating this homo uh, homography between this and this, you are able to transfer this coordinate to the coordinate on the the PDF of this uh, document, so that we are able to know which word you are looking at. This one, and this is the the recorded demonstration of the reading life log. And you can see here, red word is uh, correctly recognized here uh, by using this technology. Yeah. Okay. So by using this technology, what we can do is a kind of uh, which what we call mutual analysis. The first one is that reading activities are uh, can be analyzed by using the contents of what he or she has read. So, what kind of what kind of uh, document she is reading is important factor to characterize her reading activity. But uh, on the other hand, the read documents can also be characterized by uh, the the person who read this. Some are not. Uh, some do did not have any interest to the contents, or some are quite interested in the contents. Those type of information can be naturally obtained by using this technology. Yeah. So, after the success of this reading life log uh, uh, project, we launched the learning augmentation. So let me introduce. This is the, the main part of my talk. So learning augmentation is uh, the terminology we have uh, uh, started using. And uh, this is uh, means that intelligent augmentation for human learning. Uh, okay. So, uh, intelligent augmentation uh, uh, of uh, intelligence augmentation uh, for human learning can be done by using this uh, sensing estimation actuation model. Uh, we call it the C model. And uh, at the 
at the part of the sensing, we have uh, used the various types of uh, sensing technologies like eye tracking and EOG and EG or posture or uh, heart rate, galvanic skin response, skin temperatures. These are used. I'm going to uh, introduce a little bit more details about this part. And by using this sensing technology, we're able to estimate the several different uh, kinds of uh, states of a learner, like knowledge state or cognitive state or active, affective state. And these are used to, to decide uh, the what to do next. So the, the actuation is a feedback uh, from uh, based on the estimation, when and where, what and how to learn uh, by giving back the uh, feedback uh, of uh, to the learner in terms of the the contents of the learning or uh, some kind of suggestion to to take a rest or something like this and it's that because the time is limited and I'm, uh, I'm focusing on some parts of this uh, sensing and estimation and actuation so let me start the sensors we have used. So we have used the many different times and uh, this vertical uh, scale represent the cost of the sensor in the US dollar. And the most expensive one we used is uh, F Nils. And this is gigantic. It's a kind of refrigerator size of the sensor, uh, but it uh, can, uh, uh, um, analyze the uh, brain activity like this one. And also the, we uh, also used the heavily used uh, eye tracker. And SMI is the, the company, the German was a German company which made the eye tracker, but now it was bought by Apple. So that no longer exists here. Uh, in nowadays, but the 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 technology is used in Apple, I guess. And then uh, Google Glass, as well as uh, Emotive EG EG device for the computer scientists, which is way easier to use as compared to the medical level of uh, EEG devices. And Jin's mean, and some of you have already known, but the the Japanese eyeglass company jeans made a nice uh, device uh, with uh, sensing technology. I'm going to, to go into a little bit more details about this one. And uh, the eye tracker. And the Toby is another, or the, currently the, the, the most ma major, most uh, the important or major company of producing uh, eye tracking eye tracking technologies, but uh, they uh, started producing the eye tracking device for the not for the research purpose, but for the gaming purpose. And uh, for the for the case of, for example, the shooting game, uh, the people can uh, look at something, and then uh, the the gun is pointed to that target, something like this. And because of the, the the different usage, it was really uh, reasonable the, the, in terms of the price. But the recently they stopped producing this one, unfortunately, but we are uh, using uh, this uh, reasonable eye tracking devices. And also the another extreme uh, with the lowest cost is the software implementation of eye tracking technology. And I believe that Professor Sato has also worked on this field uh, for, for many years and uh, producing the successful uh, technology. And we are also working on this one. In addition, so we used uh, several different uh, types of uh, sensors like this one. This one is a seat pressure sensor. If you put uh, this sensor on your seat, 
the the pressure distribution is <clears throat> the times uh, recorded as a time series data. And also the the this is the old version, but the E4 wristband is to measure the galvanic skin responses as well as heart rates. And the galvanic skin responses means the the amount of your sweat. And if you have a strong pressure or something surprising, you are you're having a little bit of sweat, and this sensor, this part, uh, uh, can be sensed by this uh, the wristband sensor. And also, we analyze the typing typing timing, like this one. So uh, let me uh, explain a little bit more about the genes meme. The, the currently, this is also uh, not on the market anymore, but the, the, uh, this is really um, um, epoch making because before this uh, device, <clears throat> uh, this electro-oculography uh, is just only for the research purpose, but not for the end users. But this is the first device which allows uh, end users to use this technology for their uh, tracking of the, the eye movement. As you can see here, they have three electrodes here. And then in addition to the uh, six axis um, uh, motion sensors. And by using this uh, EOG sensors, uh, uh, electrodes, we are able to detect the, the eye movement like this one. So because eye part is uh, with a plus here in front and the minuses here at the back side. So if you move the eye here like this one, this part of the voltage is going up and this part of the voltage is going down because the, the plus is going apart from this sensor. So if you go up, move up your eyes, this is higher and this is lower. So the vertical uh, horizontal movement is uh, can be sensed by using the, the difference of this electrons voltage and vertical uh, movement is the difference between these two. So using this technology, we have uh, developed uh, several uh, analysis of reading and learning activities. The lowest one is counting the number of words. We call it the word meter, uh, which is uh, coming from the pedometer step counter. And we, we think that this is the word meter is a, a step counter for your knowledge life, which means that how many words you have read in a day. And reading detection is another important aspect of the tracking of your reading activities from when to when you read. And uh, the, if you are interested in uh, more details about the, this reading activity, you may be interested in the type of the reading, what kind of document you are reading. And uh, the, my students uh, uh, sometimes a bit aware of uh, uh, using this technology, they're not always using, the, uh, reading the textbook, but mangas. Yeah, but this is it. And uh, as I told you, this is the basic implementation of the reading life log, recording all of the red words. And then the high, at the highest level, understanding ability, confidence, and no words. Uh, those, those, those information can be captured by analyzing the reading activities. Like this one, this is the case of the, the finding of the difficult word. Okay. So let's explain uh, some of the, the listed uh, functionalities. Uh, let me first uh, start with uh, what a meta, the quantifying your reading activities. And this is the uh, demonstration of the reading activity word meter. As you can see here, the blink is detected and eye movement as well. 
by analyzing the, the difference of the voltage. And now he's reading here, and the reading is detected here. But when he stopped reading, and nothing is detected, and then he starts talking, and talking is detected based on the, the head movements or eye, eye movements on the head movements. By using this technology, uh, we are able to, to build the uh, uh, water meter by using uh, the analysis of the eye movement. He's doing the calibration. After calibration, he starts re reading this uh, sentence. When finished reading one line, the word count is going up uh, based on the estimation of the, the number of words read by analyzing his eye movements like this one. His reading and line break. And line break allows us to additional uh, to, to add some words to read. And here you can see because the reading activity is detected only by using the, the glasses, it is possible uh, to read from what from anything wherever you read. This is possible to be continuously counted. At the end of the day, so you can see here the recording of the the the, the number of words read from when to when. And this is uh, uh, your detailed reading record. Okay. So how can we uh, estimate the number of words? It's so simple. As you can see here, uh, our eye movement is not uh, uh, smooth, but uh, altering the, the two states, fixation and saccade. Fixation is a is a kind of stop of uh, of your eyes at some point. It's about the something about the two two hundred milliseconds, and then after that you jump to the next part, and uh, which is called the saccade. While doing the saccade, you cannot see anything, and uh, when you read something, you have forward saccade like this one and backward saccade at the time at the place of the line break. And this information can be recorded in this way. And this is the EOG output, horizontal component during the reading. And the forward saccade is detected like this and the backward saccade is detected like this. And between the two backward saccade, we're able to count the number of forward saccades and this allows us to estimate the number of words. This is a simple regression uh, function and which is learned by the user's behavior. So, so we learned uh, user's behavior in uh, two different ways. One is user, user independent. Uh, someone else's data can be used to, to detect uh, or to estimate the number of words by other persons. And the user dependent um, estimation is also possible if you're uh, okay to give the, some kind of reading data to the system. So user-independent estimation is way more difficult than the user-dependent estimation. As you can see here, the average error rate is different. But even with a user-independent estimation, this is almost similar uh, to the error rate of the step counter, pedometer, so that the pedometer is now used in our daily life, so that why not for the water meter? Is our uh, conclusion. So, by using this type of information, we are able to think more about actuations. And uh, the this is based on the fact that the ex extensive reading. Maybe you have not known anything about extensive reading. So this is simple way of learning languages. Just continuously read a lot of materials. This allows you to acquire naturally the language. If the 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 the, 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 the rate of the unknown words is less than 90 or less than 5%, the people can guess easily 
uh, the meaning of the unknown words without looking up the dictionary. So extensive reading is really an important uh, way of learning languages. So, and uh, because of the, the function of the word meta, we are able to show the number of words read. But in addition, so we can think more about how to uh, convince the learner to read more. So we have uh, tested the three more different uh, actuators. One is uh, actuator number two, goal setting. How, how many words you're, you're going to, to read in a day. And this is the notification. So the, this is based on the recording of your reading activities. When, from when to when you often read, from where to where, the, I mean the location, from where uh, to you read. And uh, if you, uh, the, this smartphone application detect that you're in the specific location, you're often reading, or you're, you're in the time frame, you're often reading. So notification is given. And the final one is peer pressure. And uh, by forming the group of people, sharing the, the amount of reading. So if someone else is uh, in, in the group, is working hard to, to achieve the goal. So this is uh, gives give the learner to a little bit of pressure uh, not to be behind uh, of by someone else. Okay. So we did the experiment by using the uh, the twenty nine participants and uh, with uh, with uh, the definition that uh, this uh, actuators are effective if the number of red words increased by twenty percent or more from no feedback situation. So unfortunately or fortunately, by just showing the number of red words is effective, just only one fourth of people. And goal setting is quite effective, and the notification is so-so, and the PR pressure is the most effective. And we, we, at, at this time, we are also interested in who are going to be influenced by using these uh, actuators. And we realized that some kind of tendency exists so we use the simple machine learning technology by using the, the number of red words without the feedback, as well as the, the this is a big five personality test result. And by using these features, we are able to select the people who are positively influenced by this uh, actuator uh, and to improve the this uh, effective rate from 62% to 90%. So this is the result of this experiment. So the next one is confidence aware learning. So if you learn something, you are always learning something and then doing the test to make it sure that learning is successfully done. And if this is not, you review uh, the result of the, the, you know, the unsuccessful cases and then do the test. This is a simple, but the kind of golden standard way of learning. So in this context, we are only uh, taking care of the two state uh, status of the knowledge, correct or incorrect. But uh, my, our question uh, is that at the time was that, is it enough? And the, we, our answer is no, no, not really. So we need to consider more about the internal state of the knowledge, confident or unconfident. So this is good uh, to have a correct answer with a confidence state, and it's quite natural. Incorrect answer is given with, uh, without the confidence. But we have two more different conditions. One is the correct answer is given without the confidence. Maybe this is by chance. So this is necessary for us to review, include the review, even, if, even with the correct state, because we are not really sure whether this knowledge is uh, successfully acquired by the learner. Another more serious case is uh, the incorrect answer is given by the confidence, given with the confidence. 
Uh, this is based on the often based on the misunderstanding, so that you need to revise, revise your relate your knowledge to make it sure that no more the, the incorrect answer is given. Okay. And this is the demonstration. He's putting the eye tracker. So the start uh, using the eye tracker to solve the four choice English drama questions. As you can see here, uh, the detected eye gaze is shown here for the demonstration purpose, but in the real use, it is not shown because it, uh, it disturbs the learning process. When he's the solving this issue, uh, this. Uh, Fixation of such case are recorded in, internally in the system of the analysis of the conflict. When uh, he finished uh, answering to all of those questions, he received the estimation results. Like uh, this one, correct answer was without confidence, and this is the correct answer with high confidence. And these are used, this information is used for the Review. This is with a confidence, this is with that confidence. It's not so difficult to differentiate these two uh, uh, states. But 90% of the accuracy can be obtained by using the, 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 the eye tracking device. So this is the result of the confidence of real learning. And this is the, the, the estimation based on the eye tracking technology. We also worked on the, the analysis of type timing uh, to do the same thing, uh, the estimation of the confidence. So if you're not really sure what to type, your start of typing is delayed. And this also holds for the, the, the case of the giving the answer by using the hand grading. And these are used, but uh, for the case of this one, the, we did the further uh, experiment about the giving the feedback uh, uh, to know whether or not this is the, this feedback is effective or not. So at the the pretest, we used the 120 queries uh, to estimate the confidence, and then uh, some of them are uh, going to be uh, fed back as a for the review purpose and then post test is done and this graph shows the this is correct answer uh the at the time of post test same same question was used uh, so these are the 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 performance of the post test uh for for the questions with the correct answer at the pretest and this one is incorrect answer at the pretest let me uh, show you a little bit more about the, the correct at the post uh, prayer test. This is correct answer with confidence, and this is correct answer without confidence. So without the confidence, the the correct answer rate drops down. Even uh, in the case that the correct answer was given at the prayer test. At the post test, the users are not able to, to give the correct answer again. Because of the, the without with because of the lack of the confidence, but if we give the feedback uh, for the review, the 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 correct answer rate stays as much as this one. And for the case of incorrect answer at the pretest, this is incorrect answer without the confidence. This is without with the confidence the the same incorrect answer rate low, but if we give the feedback uh, for the case of uh, incorrect answer with confidence, their knowledge uh, can be revised, could be revised uh, to, to improve that correct answer rate. So this means that the, the confidence aware learning or the, the feedback or reviewing process based on the confidence would be quite effective. So the next one is accuracy improvement by using the self-supervised learning. 
uh, for the case of reading detection and the confidence of AI learning. So maybe some of you have already known what the self-supervised learning is, but this is based on the small number of uh, 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 labeled data set and uh, with the help of uh, large num large amount of unlabeled data set. This is simply because small labeled the, or label, labeling the data set is really, really quite with the high cost. So that in order to, to keep the costs as low as possible, the number of labeled data set can be or need to be small. But on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, the unlabeled data set is just an output of the sensor data so that it may not be so difficult, so easy to correct. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Okay, so the first uh, task is uh, reading detection. So uh, uh, at the time of introduction, I introduced the reading detection uh, as a kind of process of detecting reading versus not reading. But here, in this case, uh, more detailed reading activity is detected. One is not reading, the other one is, uh, another one is reading English text and reading Japanese text written horizontally and reading Japanese text written vertically. So some of you for from a different country may not know this, but uh, in Japan, some of the, 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 in the contents are written vertically like this one. And this is mostly like a novels or newspapers as compared to the, the this is a scientific materials. So the distinction of these two are quite informative for us. So what we have done is by using the, the genes mean, which allows us to use accelerometer, gyroscope data, as well as, well as EOG data and movement data. And uh, self-supervised learning is done by using this framework, uh, by using the, the, the pretext task. I'm going to go into the details, but uh, the network is trained. And by using this trained network, this is used to the further you know, training uh, the, 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 this network by using the, the labeled data set. And in our case, these four class of classification of reading activity is done by using the pre-trained network. So the first one is uh, the, the pre-training phase and using the sensor data. Uh, this, these are the examples of sensor data. This is accelerometer, and this is gyroscope, and this is EOG. And uh, as a, as a uh, Self-supervised learning, uh, we employed the, this eight or seven different types of transformation. So this is original data, and this is noise added, noise added data, and this is scale change data. This is horizontal flip, flip data, and this is vertical flip data, time warp, permutation, and channel shuffling, and rotation. And these, um, uh, simple signal processing can be done by disturbing the, the original uh, data. And the task here is to distinguish uh, which class of uh, transformation is given uh, to, the, to the data. So this means that the task is or eight class or seven class classification. And after the training, we use this uh, base network uh, by uh, uh, trained based on the pre-training task to do the further fine tuning of the, the this trained network by using the the data labeled data and this is the uh, sorry this is the the end of the reading detection and another task is the confidence estimation we did the same but for this case the two class classification program is given confident or unconfident by using the MCQ format. And there's a kind of pretext task. Uh, this is the simpler eye tracking data is given. And uh, 
as a, as a pretext task, we use four different types of uh, transformation with the image of the eye gaze. This is no transformation, rotation, flip, uh, vertical flip or horizontal flip. And let me show you the uh, result. And uh, this one is the result of the reading detection task. And this one is the result of the confidence estimation task. And because the reading detection task is a task of full class classification problem, chance rate is uh, 25% with the equal size of the labeled data. And this is the uh, confidence estimation case. Um, chance rate is 50%. Uh, by using the same features obtained by the sensors and the training with the support vector machine, the accuracy improved something like this. Uh, the horizontal axis is the number of training samples per class, and the vertical axis is accuracy. And if you increase the number of training samples, it improves, but the, the, it's not so uh, highly effective. And by using the free supervised uh, deep learning without the pre pre-training, which means that this uh, base network is uh, trained by using the labeled data from scratch. And uh, as the, the number of training sample increases, the, the accuracy rapidly increases, as you can see here. And this also holds for the case of confidence estimation. But uh, importantly, the self-supervised Self-supervised learning help us to learn uh, the, 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 the task much better than the, the without self-supervision. So here you can see the big gap between the accuracy, uh, between these two accuracy here as well. And if you have if you do not have enough amount of labeled data, the self-supervising helps. We use the this uh, eye gaze analysis technology uh, uh, in the context of crowdsourcing, and this is a bit kind of off topic, but the quality assessment. So the 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 task of crowdsourcing is given in such a format. It's quite similar to our four choice question format. Please answer to select the one one of them for based on this question or something like this. And uh, some of them, uh, uh, the spam workers, just choosing the randomly, uh, the, the choices to earn money without without uh, doing anything info, inf uh, meaningful. But uh, uh, in addition to these spam workers, uh, some workers are not so skilled some workers are skilled. And in order to, to, to collect uh, good results from the crowdsourcing, we, to, uh, we need to distinguish the skilled workers from unskilled ones. And the same technology can be used for that purpose. And this is the result of the, the, the I'm skipping all of the details of the method, but it's quite similar. And this is the, the the horizontal axis is a number of tasks given to uh, one single worker. And uh, this is the mean absolute error of the correct answer uh, to the correct answer and the mean correct answer rate. And this is true correct answer and predicted correct answer. And this is the difference. The baseline means the mean correct answer rate estimation based on the mean correct answer rate, which is not known in the context of, in the real context of crowdsourcing. But by using the deep learning technology, self-supervised learning, this is estimation can be going down uh, as the number of uh, tasks increase. So for example, if you watch the, the behavior of 20 uh, samples, 20 tasks, 20 answers, you are able to estimate the mean absolute, uh, estimate the, the correct answer rate with a mean absolute error less than uh, 15%. Okay, so the next talk is going back to the original learning task, estimation of cognitive load. So it is well 
or sometimes known that the distribution of the, the temperature on the faces can be different from based on the, the hardness of the task. So for example, if you are answering to a real, real hard task, this temperature is going up because of the, the brain, your brain activities. And as a relative to the heat it up this part, your nose, nose tip uh, at the tip of the nose, is the temperature is going down. So if we move, uh, we, sorry, if we measure the difference of the temperature between these two points, it is possible to estimate how hard the task is to the to the uh, to the learner. And our, one of my colleagues uh, did the, this experiment by using three or four different levels of tasks. Actually, this is n back task. This is one back, two back, three back, four back task. And four back tasks is almost impossible for me to do. Uh, and if you're young enough, it can be done. But this is really hard. But anyway, so as you can see here, the, you can see the clear difference of the, the level of the task as the difference of the, the voltage, uh, difference of the temperature. And sometimes we experience that uh, for some cases, uh, some students, uh, the, on some students, difference are not as high as this one and around here. And this means that he or she gave up uh, to do. And uh, the, if you are watched by using the thermal camera, uh, your performance or your seriousness can be detected. And by using this uh, technology, uh, the DFKI people built the intelligent textbook here. And this is the textbook reading behavior by using the, the distribution of the, the temperature as well as eye gaze. Uh, they're able to, we are able to uh, select the interesting part to them or level of understanding by analyzing the reading, rereading behavior. If you're, you are not so easy to understand, it, if it is not so easy to understand, you reread the same part again and again. So that reading, rereading is an important uh, the feature of uh, uh, to estimate the understanding. And again, the cognitive load by detecting the temperature. And this is the demonstration view of the, 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 the intelligent For the demonstration purpose, I guess it's shown here, but it's in the real earth, it's not really shown. And these are the internal states recorded in the system. And this is the temperature distribution. And you can see here, um, I guess it's recorded. You can also see it's a heat map. And when he's started reading this part and the system can detect whether or not this part is not so easy to understand because of the rereading. So it can play an additional uh, video that helps uh, learners to learn this part or understand. It is not so easy to build such a nice and organized they also built uh, an online building, which that uh, has a model teacher in order to uh, to build such a textbook. Drop and drop contents and associate those contents out of the, the textbook. So modern uh, extension of the this intelligent textbook is based on the GPT technologies. As you can easy, easily imagine that GPT technology can be used to, to uh, generate the contents on the fly. So if the, the this part is not so easy for the learner to read or understand, the GPT can 
help us to have additional exper uh, explanations. So if you're interested in this part, the more detailed information can be given by using the GPT technologies. This is so easy to implement nowadays. So the last but not least uh, one is uh, learning with the aerobic exercise. This is uh, quite different from what uh, we have talked. But uh, this is another in inter interesting or important aspect of the learning. And I believe that this is the last topic for me to explain. And learning with aerobic exercise is, uh, some of you may say that what's, what, what is it? So another uh, aspect of uh, actuators of, for the vocabulary building. So uh, when we started uh, this experiment, we used this uh, stepper, <clears throat> uh, which is to for us to do the Arabic exercise. But now we are not using this stepper anymore, but the running machine is used to control finally the, the, the amount of uh, Arabic exercise. But anyway, so let me explain a little bit. So learning English uh, words by heart is done while doing this Arabic exercise. And it has already been known that Arabic exercise uh, helps you to learn something by heart because of the chemicals produced while doing the Arabic exercise in the brain. So this is the result of the, the one result of the the experiment. So that we did the test after uh, learning some words by hand. This is one day after. Test is both good, but three days after or one week after, these are uh, different. So the with stepper means with the with, uh, Arabic exercise is better than the, the the Arabic exercise. It has already been known, but the, the it's not so easy to produce this type of result. Sometimes if the Arabic exercise is too hard for them, so it's no longer possible to learn something by heart. If the, the Arabic exercise, the amount of Arabic exercise is too easy, the effect of uh, mem memorization is uh, quite limited so that uh, the, we have learned that the, the control of the, of the amount of Arabic exercise is quite, quite important to, to realize this positive effect of the memorize, to the memorization. And we have already done uh, the experiment. Uh, it's not included in this slide, but we have already done the experiment uh, by controlling the amount of uh, the Arabic exercise and the application of the Arabic exercise before learning or while learning by heart. And we have known that it depends on the person, which is most effective, when to do or how much to do. Okay. And uh, at this time, uh, it did not work for three years, There's no change or worse in the result. So this is uh, also needs to be personalized as the 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 actuators uh, for the reading uh, uh, water meter. So coming back to the original slide, uh, when I started talking about the the learning augmentation, reading to the mind is what exercise is to the body. This was this was said by the. Uh, Irish writer, but what we have experienced is uh, running, uh, the, sorry, exercise is not only for the body, but also for the mind. Yeah, okay, so let's, let me summarize the, my talk. So reading is an important activity for us to learn something. So reading of reading activity, uh, reading means analyzing. The reading activity tells us the quality and the quantity of reading and learning. And this is quite important, as you have already uh, uh, seen uh, in my talk. 
And the effectiveness of sensors and actuators depend on their recipe, recipients and the recipes as well. So that the personalized uh, you know, um, application of those technologies, we call it the prescription, is, is quite important for the for this type of technology. Okay, that's all for my talk and thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to accept your questions. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, so for those uh, uh, who, are, who have been attending this uh, the seminar, uh, if you have any questions, please put your uh, question in the chat box. Uh, in the meantime, I, I actually thank you, thank you very much uh, for thank the you. wonderful talk. And I have uh, quite a few questions that, that I, would like, I would like to ask you personally. But uh, let me um, ask you uh, two questions. Yes. The one is, uh, let me put this in the uh, chat box. So about the water meter for measuring the reading activities, I think it's important and also interesting to see long-term studies uh, to get some insight on the merit and potential, maybe risks. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you comment on the expectation and challenges? Yeah, this is yeah the kind of frequently asked question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, yeah. The, the, it's so natural that long-term behavior change can be done by using this technology, this type of technology. And we have not yet done the long-term uh, studies, mm. but some of the, the middle term studies tells us that it's not so easy to keep uh, learners attract, being attracted. Mm. So it's sometimes not so easy. Mm. And actuators must be, uh, you know, uh, changed or more sophisticated actuators must be incorporated to do the long term, uh, to, to keep the, the activity as high as uh, the beginning. And uh, the effect of the long term, uh, for, for the case of uh, the water meter, mm. uh, the extensive reading has already been proved that it's quite effective for the long term mm. learning English. So, but the, the effect of the water meter is mm. quite limited mm. if we do not do anything more specific. Mm. So, and uh, it's not included in my talk today, but I'm now wearing the, this ring. Mm -hmm. uh, this is called the uh, sensor ring, called the uh, aura ring. And this ring has already been distributed to more than 100 students in my uh, university oh. mm -hmm. and uh, recorded the, their data mm -hmm. for more than two years right now. Mm -hmm. And this is the first uh, long term study. And we have already known a lot about the uh, behavior, who is going to stop using it, or who is coming back, mm. and what kind of effect is given. And uh, we are using this the pool of people as a pool of experiments mm. of doing another type of uh, uh, learning experiment. Mm. So we are now analyzing the behavior of uh, the sleeping. This is a sleep detector. Mm. The sleep quality can be associated with uh, their learning activities. But anyway, so thank you very much for your comment. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. So, okay. Uh, the other question is, it's a little bit more technical stuff, uh, technical thing. So about the confidence confidence uh, estimation based on eye tracking. So uh, could you comment on its dependence on the contents, such as the subject of learning materials or documentary layouts? Yeah. <laughs> Document layout is quite, quite uh, uh, influential. Mm. And we are training uh, the, the current the confidence estimation based on the fixed uh, format. Mm, this is right. easy. This mm. is easy. If you have enough no amount of uh, the labeled data, it's not so difficult mm. because the, the user's behavior is so different. Mm. But if you are having the general document, for example, with a normal layout and the tell us whether or not you're, uh, you're confident enough about this part or not. If you have a normal horizontally mm. written text, it may be possible as a as the case of uh, intelligent textbook. Mm. But uh, the if you're in the world setting and mm. doing anything else, mm. 
mm. from time to time reading mm. something this is really an uh, uh, important factor for us to 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 bring the technology in the real life mm. but it is it is really difficult I see. And as you know, that eye tracking technology is not ready uh, to use in such a in the wild setting. I see. So yeah, but anyway, the 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 technology is uh, improving, mm. so that in the near future, I believe or I hope that yeah. uh, it can be uh, possible. Uh, it can be possible to do. The same. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> agree. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So. Um... So lastly, so let me ask one more question. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to ask one more. Uh, probably this is probably this is a, like a frequently asked question. Yeah. But like a kind of as a general question, do you do you uh, what is how how do you think about the privacy issues? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Of the measuring the learning activities mm -hmm. like from various uh, cues like eye tracking and body motion and etc. Et yeah. So. Yes. This is really, uh, yeah, the, 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 really the big issue. And as mm -hmm. you, you know, as a researcher of the computer vision, mm -hmm. Sato has already experienced a lot about the, mm -hmm. this one. So that if we would like to measure the, the student's learning activity or studying activity in a class, mm -hmm. uh, so it's so difficult. Mm. Uh, to get an agreement, mm. Mm. So, so that and uh, this has also the positive and negative effect. Mm. Uh, and uh, if he, the students are, you know, uh, it's a kind of observer effect. If students ha have already known that we are watched, mm. technology it, it right. affects right. It, it emotionally right. affects something. Right. So and uh, this is also quite bad. Mm. And uh, but the, it's not possible for us to do do it in a secret way. Mm. This is invasion of the privacy, so that mm. it's not possible. And uh, the if you are using this type of technology as a kind of personal use, mm. if you are in front of your own computer mm. and doing something by yourself mm. without uh, connecting or giving the this data to anyone else, mm. okay. But uh, if you do this in a public place or doing in a uh, public school or something like this, it's not so easy. But I if see. a private uh, school like a Juku in mm. Japan, mm. it may be possible and some results have already been obtained in this context. I see. Yeah. yeah. So Thank it, you. It's quite uh, difficult. <laughs> and yeah. Sometimes uh, the, some, the, uh, the parents can be uh, going mad. <laughs> 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 Okay. okay yeah thank you very much okay so um okay let we don't see any other questions in the ch uh, chat box so okay so then i would like to conclude uh the professor kisei's uh the seminar uh kisei sensei thank you very much for your wonderful talk yeah thank you thank you very much